Explaining football to the friend who's just there for the nachos? Hard. Tailgating from home like a pro with snacks and drinks everyone will love? An easy win. And with Instacart helping deliver the snack time MVPs to your door, you're ready for the game in as fast as 30 minutes. So you never miss a play or lose your seat on the couch or have to go head to head for the last chicken wing. Shop game day faves on Instacart and enjoy $0 delivery fees on your first three grocery orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Other fees and terms apply. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, Jim. And that voice that you can hear, guys, is Mr. Matt Eastley. Oh, and by the way, welcome to Book Corner Extra Time. What we do on the current view, we look at a book every month and then we hook up with the author of that book. And this month it is Matt Eastley, who's written a fantastic book about one of the all time great commentators and presenters, Mr. Brian Moore, and how he saved our Sundays. Before we get into how you got hold of the title and what you're doing now, talk yeah. to us about who Matt Eastley is. Who's Matt Eastley? God, that's a, that's a big question, Paul. You just asked me there. Uh, who's Matt Eastley? Well, I was born in the greatest year of the 20th century, 1966, a World Cup baby, uh, also a huge uh, Beatles fan, and that was the best year for the Beatles, I think. So uh, grew up on the... Uh, Borders of, of Kent and South East London. There's only one club you can really follow, if in my view, if you're born where I'm born, and that's Charlton Athletic. So, Charlton Athletic fan from a very, very early age. Um, uh, trained journalist, writer, author, broadcaster. Um, written a number of books, actually, Paul. Written a, um, a series of books about the, the FA Cup uh, through the eyes of fans that were there. I did all the cup finals from the 60s, 70s and 80s. So it involved tracing uh, lots of fans who were at those games. And it was actually called When the FA Cup Really Mattered because I think, I know. Uh, you know, I felt quite strongly that the FA Cup had lost its uh, lost its glamour. I know I know, we still get that thing. And I'm very close to Maidstone United, actually. So I'm just talking to you after, you know, Maidstone United probably disproved that theory about the FA Cup. So I've written a number of books, but I'm, all, you know, really interested in that kind of, sweet spot of I guess of my childhood 70s 80s the great players you know the days of kind of three four channels uh, pre-internet um, uh, pre-premier league really um, just that uh, so many of us seem to hark back and I've just written a series you know my books have usually been um, in in of that ilk really Paul uh, except for the one I wrote about 1966 World Cup final where I traced loads of people who went to that um, game it's called 66 on 66 um, which was you know thoroughly enjoyable I didn't go down the usual route of uh, interviewing players I went for kind of fans photographers police officers members of the band uh, who were there on the day and um, so that's kind of really I guess my if I've got a kind of USP if you like it's so it's kind a trawl in that kind of period, 60s, 70s, 80s, for um, personal memories, really, of football matches and uh, just, just kind of growing up and nostalgia, I guess, really. That ticks every that's box. kind of who I am. That ticks every box for me because that's pretty much who I am. When I say a 70s book or a 60s book, 80s and, yeah, OK, 90s, before the Premier League, it really gets my juices going. I'm not yes. a great lover of the modern game. I no, nor me. It. I watch it. Um, we do a, 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 the current view with with Terry Curran, um, but it's very retro as well. We do always look back. We have a Legends Lounge. I'm really interested in those FA Cup books. We have featured them on the current view before. What other books have you? Have, yeah, have yeah, you? we have. have you yeah. Featured them? yeah, we have. Yeah, oh, there, right. there was one about the seventies, wasn't there? There was one the sixties, one the seventies, one the if it's the series that I'm yeah. thinking of. So, so the sixties was called from Barry Stobart to Neil Young. The seventies was called from uh, who was it? Oh God, Ronnie from Radford, Roger, wasn't it? Ronnie, Ronnie Radford yeah. to Roger Osborne. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've done them, have you? Yeah, oh, we've, we've, well, co- well, I'm we've flattered. covered. I'm flattered. And yeah. we've previously done a, a book corner with um, my football books, but uh, Andy sadly doesn't do it any longer. But we made 15 podcasts, and your books cropped up quite often in oh, our, uh, our talking of football books. 
Well, um, well, I, I'm chuffed that they, they're finding an audience of people who uh, appreciate them. And because I see, you sometimes think you're ploughing a bit of a lone furrow, Paul. You know, you think is there mm-hmm. the people, the people as nerdy as me, as obsessed with this? I guess I'm obsessed by the minutiae of it as well, and I kind of really want to research the life out of these subjects. But, but I like to go for a slightly left field um, view. And the, the other thing I do is I always talk to people who were there yeah. if possible you know so fans who were at the games or and i've done the same thing with this book about brian moore i should i should add actually but why it's very much about brian moore and brian moore's sons and family are so supportive it is looking at the whole spectrum of uh, regional televised football in the sense so i look at every single region anglia yorkshire uh time tees central uh sorry atv as it was you know in your case being a, being a brummy you know hugh johns hugh john's son has been wonderful to me and continues to be so i've had buy-in from all these people that have told me first-hand accounts of what it was like to work on the big match or star soccer as it was in the midlands and people like martin tyler jerry harrison Gerald sinstad i was very lucky to speak to before he uh, sadly passed away but so i've really spoken to a lot of uh, key people uh, as i say in the course of the of the time paul a few people sadly have uh, have died because it's been a project quite long in the uh, making really how long has it taken you to make it well, I mean, the, the actual idea came about about 10 years ago because one of the things I should have said is actually um, I, I'm a big supporter of non-league football. So uh, while Charlton Athletics is my side, my sort of non-league side is Tunbridge Angels in the um, National South. And I've been following them a lot. And um, you might know that Martin Tyler is quite heavily involved in, in kind of non-league football. He's, yeah. he's basically been assistant manager. And um, I got talking to him once when he, when he was at, um, came down to Tunbridge and um, I, just through that, I, I was very interested about his time on the on the, kind of the on LWT and the big match. And I did a series in Back Pass uh, magazine, Got you. looking at every region. Brilliant. And uh, so I covered every single region and, and during that. And so really, this book is a kind of a, 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 a kind of culmination of all that work, but very much a kind of fresh approach to it. And so, but that's going back about ten years. So it's been kind of ten years in the sort of making but really i didn't really start working on it in earnest until about two years ago and um kind of brought it all together because all the interviews that i did and all the information takes so much time to research and i'm probably guilty of um over researching this if you like if you can over research and so i'm one if you can picture i'm like wallowing knee deep in Rothman's football yearbooks and looking at old stuff on youtube and you know, going through every season of every um, or every regional television, thinking about the great highlights, the great characters. People like Stan Bowles, of course, who've just died. You know, was a growing up watching the big match. Players like Stan Bowles were really kind of big for me. You know, if I wasn't a QPR fan, but he was a player that kind of the big match really brought to life. And players like Trevor Brookin and uh, uh, Charlie George at Arsenal. Um, so it's been sad to, in a way, it's been very sad writing this because so many, so many of those great players are no longer with us, but you know, so many, so many more are. But so there's sadness mixed in with the the pleasure of revisiting all this time, really, Paul. I guess. So what, why, and how was the focus on Brian Moore? Because and also as well, you've got the that was the regionalised stuff was on ITV, but we had in the. Uh, August of 1964, the year of my birth, Phil yep. Chisnell of Liverpool kicked off match of the day. Of course, on absolutely. BBC too. So we had yeah. the BBC and we had ITV, but we had great commentary and 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 it was it was very similar in the format. But how did the formats differ for the different regions? Because like on the uh, with with your the big match in the London area, they seem to have more players in the studio talking yes. about the game we didn't have yes. that at star soccer yeah well well i mean first of all it's a very good point you make about the kind of the big match and it went the big match in 1964 oh sorry the, sorry the match of the day when it started in 1964 when the big match and all the lwt all the itv franchises were redist- redistributed in the late 60s lwt decided they wanted to do everything that the big match didn't they wanted to really really modernize television televised football so they brought in much kind of younger producers directors bob gardham is a name that uh, 
people should know, but Bob Garden was really the, the, the director that um, produced the blueprint for the way football is televised today. He did all these things like close-ups of players, interesting angles. The way football was produced by LWT in the big match was revel- absolutely revolutionary more tabloid, if you like, than the kind of BBC. Um, in terms of what was different, I mean, for a start, LWT was by far the um, the biggest region uh, and by far it had most money. Now, LWT, um, because it was based in the capital, I think, and it was able to throw more resources, but that didn't always sit comfortably with every region, certainly a region like Granada, um, with the, uh, you know, with, with Gerald since there, but but really the key character in Granada was a gentleman called Paul Doherty, son of uh, Peter Doherty, the former Manchester City player, who was the Legend. producing director. I mean, absolutely. Oh, geez, but Granada, was. absolutely. But Granada resented, um, I think, LWT's domination. So they really, really um, worked hard with something like Kickoff and Kickoff Match, which was the, the region there. In answer to your question, yeah, much lower budget in um, in the Midlands. I've spoken at great length to um, Gary Newborn and uh, and um, Hugh John's son, Mark, um, uh, Trevor East, people like that, people told me. So it was a much... It wasn't, a, from what I can remember, but it certainly wasn't a studio based. It was done from the ground. It was a piece of camera interviews done at the ground. Much, much lower production value. So LWT, yeah, had the kind of money and the resources, yes. And the thing is, Paul, this is very important, the, the fact that a sun, it was a Sunday afternoon program yeah. mm-hmm. gave the regions a lot more time than BBC did to craft a show um, and, and bring in those regional highlights and have things like studio guests. Jimmy Hill's analysis in 1968 was also revolutionary, re- revolutionary for, for its time. So that kind of in-studio analysis was all new. And there were various attempts to uh, to, to, to emulate. Of course, Jimmy Greaves came to um, Star Soccer in, in, in 1980, but LWT was very much the kind of the leader. That said, there were some excellent, excellent programs being football programs being produced around the network, and it was this unique Sunday, Sunday spot that it had, which I think sits so comfortably with so many of us, and so many people associate Sunday football with Sunday roast, for instance, Sunday roast dinner, or coming back from the pub, watching the game, or because it was Saturdays, Sundays in the seventies in Britain were pretty boring, really. I mean, I had to go to church, uh, which I write about in a book, actually. It's not about me, but there's a demonstration of how bland most Sundays were. And then you had this great explosion of television, these great soundtracks after after all sitting down to lunch. And you have these great players like Stan Bowles, Frank Worthington. Who do you support, sir, Paul, by the way? I am a Birmingham City supporter Birmingham, for my sins. I, I write a lot about Birmingham City in there. Bob Hatton, Trevor yeah. Francis, um, uh, Bob Latchford, all these great players. I mean, that Birmingham side was fantastic. I mean, you know, that kind of, with that, that brilliant kind of blue with the white sort of big block Pain, down it, you know, yeah. Latchford when he first came on him. Yeah, and I've, got, I've forgotten what great player Bob Hatton was, actually. Some of his goals yeah. that were on Star Soccer were absolute quality. So, you know, the, these Sunday programmes brought these players to life. You know, they made stars locally. You hear things like in Yorkshire or um, or Tynetees, like Hull City players like Chilton and Wagstaff, mm. uh, who became stars locally because regional television made them stars. And I think you got that from and T's, players like Malcolm McDonald and John Tudor or Billy Hughes at, uh, at Sunderland, Middlesbrough with Adam Fogg and players, John Hickson, players like that, you know, became stars in their own right because of um, regional televised football. And of course, we grew to love our own commentators, in, you know, who, Hugh Johns, I mean, absolutely fantastic commentator, Gerald Sinstad. Martin Tyler and Keith Macklin in Yorkshire, Jerry Harrison, you know, they trip off the tongue and people remember these um, players. Well, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, but you can probably tell I'm a bit passionate about this subject. So, um, um, so if you're trying to get a word in edgeways there, Paul, oh, please do ask me another question. I love people that are passionate. You're that passionate, you've written books. Um, I just, my job is just to metaphorically hold a microphone 
and you just do all the talking. Well, I can do. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to hog the my. But I'll talk all day about it. As you can probably <laughs> imagine. It was an absolute labour of love. And I've got to say, the buy-in I've had from people like uh, Martin Tyler, Jim Rosenthal, uh, been fantastic with their time. Jerry Harrison in Anglia, fantastic. And as I was able to build the trust of people within the industry, people opened up their contacts book to me and said, yeah, this is his number, this is his number. So I was able to get right to the heart of these programs, talk to people who were involved in them, both you know, on screen, in the production team behind it, or on the mic, um, which has been an absolute pleasure. And to hear stories like you know, Jerry Harrison telling me about broadcasting from Chelmsford City in the FA Cup in 1973 against Ipswich or, you know, the light or, or, or Norwich, you know, players perched in Norwich City you had to perch right behind the goal in the early days. And just these little quirks of their patch used to go round and the little ways that each each region worked, you know, Gary Newborn, um, you know, it's got some great stories. Um and uh, yeah, absolute, abs- absolute pleasure. And so each, and I do tell a little bit about the kind of the the history, if you like, of televised football. You mentioned 1964 and, and the match of the day launched. Um, it was a huge, huge opposition to televised football. And people forget how strong it was. The the football authorities were absolutely terrified of televised football because they thought it would kill the game. They thought it would stop people coming through the turnstiles. Um, not really understanding the power of television to popularise football and to actually make want to people people want to go. And I'm sure you were the same. I went and watched a game of football. Didn't stop me watching it. Either. In fact, you, you, you'd you make sure you watched it the next day. Yeah. Um, you go to a game, you say, oh, because I remember that bit. Oh, yeah, I remember that bit happening in the game. I remember happening in the game. That happened in the game, but the, the television, the the, um, the the football authorities, particularly Alan Hardacre, were dead set against football. But the, and the region, that, funny enough, the region that really pioneered televised football was Anglia. Um, they were the ones that kind of really um, spearheaded it, and the others kind of followed. Anglia TV, uh, when Sir Ralph Ramsey was at Ipswich Town in the early 60s, um, Anglia TV managed to get an agreement. Uh, with Ipswich Town to televise a few games and, and somehow the FA relented and that was kind of the genie was out of the bottle at that stage. There had been sporadic occasional games before that, obviously you had the cup final and some international games but league football was, was not really televised at all. I mean there are exceptions but you know it was Anglia that really kind of opened the door and I think the late 60s was kind of the right time for it, you know, colour TV, just before colour TV. That's another big thing. Colour TV was massive um, in, in televised football. So all these things were coming together. Uh, you know, England winning the World Cup in 66, you know, again, was an elevation of the popularity. Colour TV coming in the late 60s. And this new kind of breed of younger journalists and TV executives who kind of made these great programmes. So it was all coming together, Paul, and uh, that's where programmes like um, the big match came from. But going back to what you said about Brian Moore, I, the reason it's called Brian Moore Save My Sunday or Save Our Sundays is because growing up in Kent, um, London borders, where I did, we had the big match. That was it. So we had the big match. That was our main match. We got our main match from Arsenal, West Ham, Tottenham, Chelsea, Palace. If we were lucky, they'd come down to Charlton the Valley once a season. But that was our bread and butter. And Brian Moore, for me, was the face and voice of my Sunday. And I loved Brian Moore as a figure. He, he, he was one of those people that, to me, said that everything was well with the world. Um, what I didn't know, and I've learned subsequently from his sons, that Brian was a great warrior. Right. Uh, but he, he was he was a great worry. He used to worry about everything. He used to worry about um, he was notorious for getting to grounds early because he was absolutely terrified he'd be late. And I don't think uh, Simon or Chris or his sons, I've got to know very very well, would mind me saying he, he was a great warrior. Uh, but he didn't show it. He was an absolute consummate professional, and I and I really liked him because that's a bit of a cliche, but he was like your favourite uncle or your favourite teacher at school you know he had that kind of warmth about him um that just said everything's well with the world and uh, i think he was also a fantastic commentator and he was a fantastic presenter and he was a fantastic journalist and those three things 
are skills which um, everyone thinks they can do, but they're really, really hard. And he made it look easy. But he was a, he was brilliant, and he was the voice of my. His, you know, I've got a few voices in my childhood, but he's definitely, definitely right up there as one of them. Um, and then, of course, we'd get another match. And then if we're lucky, we get Hugh Johns coming from St Andrews or Villa Park or Highfield Road, Filbert Street, or whatever. And then we get, you know, we get... And it was always this, it was always this, uh, uh, you know, what's the next game going to be? Where is it going to be? Are we going to get Jerry Harrison? Are we going to get... Are we going to get Kenneth Walston home up in Tyne Tees? Are we going to get Keith Macklin? Are we going to get Gerald Sinstead? Are we going to get uh, Roger Malone down in HTV doing Bristol City or Bristol Rovers? Are we going to get Martin Tyler in... Uh, doing a Southampton or Portsmouth game. So it was always that kind of sense of jeopardy, if you like, that where are we going to go? What's, you know, it's... And as a kid, I mean, that to me was just so exciting. But I also, uh, Paul, think it's a little bit more than just pure football. And uh, again, for me, it's a little bit, and this is where it gets a little bit more conceptual. It's about kind of nostalgia and family. Sundays being with the family... Um, not everyone had great chances, I accept that. But for me, it was about Sunday roast. Uh, and it was a safety. It, it takes me, and I think this is why it holds a special place in so many of our hearts, that um, Sundays of our childhood are kind, were kind of a safe place, I think. I feel so anyway. And, um, you know, it's time spent with family and football. To me, I think Sunday, because Matt Lorenzo, the fame, you know, the, the sky bloke, says every time he hears Brian Moore's voice, he can taste roast beef. So people <laughs> kind of link the two together. Do you know what I mean? They link they link Sunday lunchtime football with being with the family and having their roast dinner. And I think it's, it's a different time. I think perhaps people did have spent time with the family more. And I think it's that kind of these old programs um, sort of get near the sweet spot of our childhood and upbringing and you know all these things are mixed in together food family bob latchford bob hatton you know what i mean theme tunes the great theme tunes of uh of uh the, called the young scene which was the original uh, big match one and then it was taken over by possibly the most famous or well, just there was a one called cheeky bird in between but la soiree which is the famous um the do, 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 that one um, which everybody knows. Everybody knows as well as the Who big match. Wrote and you probably you must have had one on Star Soccer as well. Yeah, I'm trying to think <clears> the <throat> Star Soccer one. Um, I mean, match of the day was Barry Stowler's, wasn't it? Ba- on the ba- ball? Barry Stowler, yeah. Before yeah. that, it was, a, and that that see that was sparked by 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 ITV having considerably better themes yeah. because I think the original was something called Drum Majorette, uh, the original match of the day, and they changed it in 1771. The um, match of the day because by with Stollers, fantastic. Is it onside or offside? It's on onside, isn't it? Um, I think it's onside. I think onside, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's either onside or offside. Isn't it? It's one of the other. We don't know what on and offside is these days. So I mean, how the well, hell can well, we remember yeah, the seventies? Yeah, no, precisely, <laughs> precisely. But everyone knows that it was a fantastic uh, theme tune. But that was in a response to the brilliant theme tunes that were being used by. Um, the ITV networks, because ITV in everything, in, in its imagery, in its titles, its opening credits, its music, um, the way the programmes were put together was so much more sharper, dynamic and modern than Match of the Day. Um, that um, Going back to the original question, that was it was actually written by um, a couple of German guys, um, oh. called, I think Varda and... Conrad Wolf Wolf and Vardo, I think. Wolf and or Wolf and Baden, but under under a um under a pseudonym of a single guy's name okay. called da- David Ordini. So it wasn't by because that threw me, it's, it's, it's credited to David Ordini, but that was actually a pseudonym for two German band leaders. So they wrote that great um big match theme tune. Um, and of course, you know, the, the famous uh, Bob Stoko uh, canter onto the pitch after the seventy three FA Cup final, we're going to embrace uh, Jim Montgomery, is cited by people in TV industry as one of the greatest bits of football direction ever. Yeah. Um, and, the co- and the commentator and director working in harmony to understand what was going to happen. So Gardham, as the director, held that shot at the end of the 73 final because he thought Stoko was going to do something interesting. And he did, and he, and he ran onto, onto the pitch and embraced Montgomery. 
I, I understand BBC actually missed that, but that was that was that was Gardner's intuition as a as a great director. Of course, that was the they were the images that accompanied that great um, theme tune. So all these things added up to quite a potent mix. Um, it was it was it was quite a special program, and um, yeah, I mean th this book is really a celebration of of all that, uh, Paul. To be honest, now in the central area, it was ATV today back in those days, and it was Billy Wright, yeah, who was the anchor man. Gary yes, Newborn was. was yeah, Gary Newborn was just coming into it, but yes. it was the great Billy Wright, and one of my customers actually own the house that Billy Wright used to stay in when he'd oh, come fantastic. up from London to do Star Soccer. And oh, I remember what, that's great, isn't it? Yeah, Trevor East, who yep. used to do a thing like with the dancing footballers in the Midlands area as well. And and they would put that to music. Yeah. I remember Alan Hudson, because I do a load of podcasts with Alan, and Hudson yeah. said Gary Newborn did something in the way he moves, the Shirley Bassey, to uh, to Alan Hudson, the way that, you know, when he was playing at Fantastic. Stoke. And yes, we did in the yes. Midlands. It seemed to be, it was either Blues or Villa or Albion. And then we had a couple of games away from home, which would be Blues, Villa or Albion. So it seemed yes. to be really centralised with Derby County, Stoke City, Nottingham Forest. So it was it was always <coughs> one of our teams away and a team that was at home. And I think the format was always three games. But again, it, it probably was a lot different. But when you look at the amount of characters that we had in, in those days, mm. it was almost like the perfect storm. I'm not sure it would happen today like it did then. As, as you alluded to, making stars of some players that you wouldn't necessarily see. Exactly. Like your Chilton and Wagstaff. Absolutely, but yeah. You know, players like Tony Curry at Sheffield United. What but, a but you player. Like, well, I mean, superb, yeah. But, I mean, also, again, your Bob Hattons, pe people like that, mm -hmm. uh, people at uh, Coventry, a bit later in the decade, like Ian Wallace and Ian Ferguson. Yes. And, yeah. uh, you know, and... Uh, I mean, of course, what a great period it was for the Midlands as well. You know, Derby and, and for Star Soccer, Derby winning the title in 72 and 75. Birmingham, you know, great season, getting promotion and that really good side. Villa, of course, went on to uh, win, win, win the title. Well, that was in... Uh, by the way, this is done in... Uh, this is being done in two or three volumes. So my first nice. volume actually only takes us... Only take, yeah, only takes us up to 75. So because there's so much information... So I've done season by season every region. I've tried to cover as many clubs as I can, and it's rammed with names of players, and many I'd forgotten, actually. But uh, it's been a joy just to kind of watch these players. I'm thinking now of Birmingham, the likes of Pendry and Calderwood and uh, Roger Hind, you know, these kind of players that you know I hadn't forgotten about, but it's uh, great to see them again. And uh, just to remind you what... Well, keep going back to Bob Hatton. I saw Bob Hatton score two or three goals. He just took brilliantly. And sometimes he, Hatton was overshadowed by Latchford and Francis. Definitely. But what a player he was, yeah. you know. And um, that's the joy of something like this. And I think these regional programmes made, as you say, Paul, made stars of these players. The flamboyant players, like your, like your Georges and your, and, and your Bowles and all this. And... Uh, uh, that 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 lead side, love them or loathe them, of the seventies, um, the early seventies, Yorkshire TV made massive stars out of those players. That's the, the Clark Bremners, uh, Lorimers, Giles, all that all that team, and you know they were great for for Yorkshire TV and Keith Macklin, who not so many people remember Keith Macklin, but he was a very very good commentator up till nineteen seventy six when Martin Tyler got the Yorkshire gig. But uh, Macklin was the, uh, was the was the was the commentator um, for the first eight years, really, uh, with Fred Dyney, just a great Fred Dyney. There's another good brummy for you. Um, Portsmouth fan, isn't he? Portsmouth fan, but mm -hmm. he's from uh, he's from Birmingham. Isn't he? I think he's from Sutton Coldfield, is he, or something? Like okay. That. Um, so he was um, he was the presenter, uh, and of course Danny Blanchflower was the first commentator for Yorkshire TV in '68. Right. Um, so all these things that you know come out of the woodwork, if you like, and uh, yeah, I've, I've I've had you know it's been great to see There's some great stories as well. You know, dogs on pitches, you know, floodlights going out, the orange ball coming out, you know, and you know special guests, the Christmas specials that the big match used to do when you'd have people like 
Elton John or you'd get people like Terry Venables, uh, uh, Rodney Marsh um, uh, presenting the show, Kevin Keegan, you know, and, and Christmas specials and the fun spots. It sounds a bit like we're talking about the dance, you know, fun spots where they'd play, uh, you know, they, they, they'd play, they'd speed up some film and put some silly music over it. All the things that the BBC wouldn't do. Yes. Um, and the ITV kind of wallowed in that unashamedly that but BBC wouldn't do it, but we're going to do it. Because- at 1-800-Flowers.com, we know that connections are at the heart of being human. Whether celebrating life's joys or comforting during tough times, 1-800-Flowers helps you express what words can't. For nearly 50 years, millions have trusted 1-800-Flowers to deliver thoughtful gifts that help create lasting bonds. Because it's more than just a gift. It's your way of showing you care. Visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST and connect today. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. We think our viewers will love it. And that was very much the... There was, and, and let's not forget, Paul, there was a lot of snobbery around. A lot of people... There's a lot of families that didn't watch ITV. They were seen as, you know, yeah. sort of a bit of a middle class mm-hmm. thing, I think. But, oh, no, we don't watch that. We watch the BBC, you know. Um, you know, we watched the match of the day. And, and ITV were having to contend with that. And, the, and BBC kind of it was the famous punch-up after the 69 Cup final between Leicester and uh, Man City because that was all about the kind of TV um, companies, the BBC and ITV, uh, wanting first um, uh, sort of interview rights with the winners after the game. That ended up with a, with a big punch-up in the tunnel. Um, so the rivalry between... BBC were definitely, their noses were put out a joint by ITV and these, frankly, quite excellent programmes, these football, televised football programmes that they um, they devised. So the book's about that. But I, I go back to Brian Moore is front of, front of house for me because he, he was my kind of icon. And uh, the book finishes with a lot of tributes to, to Brian, who died far too young and, and um, you know, cruelly just after he'd really hung up the, the, the mic um but he was a he was a good man um i never met him but i met his family and and i I, i've never heard anyone say a bad word about brian moore um and i think he's i i was pretty certain early on he was going to be kind of on the title of the book because he represents to me sunday football he also represents a very very good side to to football the side that we we love there's a sort of common decency about brian moore um, a sense of right and wrong, which kind of appealed to me as I was writing in this, because football gets a bad rep. Um, but he represented all the good stuff to me, and um, that's kind of why I wanted him on the front of the book, really. And on the ball with Brian Moore as well, they they had that program oh, yeah, on, on the Saturday, ball. didn't they? Which was the you know yeah. um, the Absolutely. equivalent to, uh, to to grandstands for a football focus with Bob Wilson. Being... Or football preview was his first call with Sam Leach, and then yeah. Wilson took over in '74. Now Sam Leach, he was the one that uh, gave Alan Clark the nickname Sniffer. You're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Sam Leach was a very, very well respected. Um, moved into television. Oh, I'm just losing you. He... A bit. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just lost you a bit then. Yeah, he was hard as nails. Sam Leach, sort of pugnacious uh, Scott, and. Uh, but um, yeah, so football preview. He went head to on the ball, went head to head with um, um, football focus football preview because it was exactly the same model. Absolutely. On the ball was within world world of sport, and um, football football focus was in grandstand. But the big thing, of course, about on the ball was that um, they went to great lengths because Brian Moore would would be filmed at the ground where he was going to be commentating that day, they went to ridiculous lengths not to reveal the identity of that ground. This was, again, was the paranoia that it would put, it would put people off if they saw where he was. Yeah. So every weekend, every, every on the ball, every Saturday, became a bit of a game around the country um, about where was Brian Moore. And you get little time, so it'd be a very, very tight shot um, if he was at Stamford Bridge or the Valley or, or, or Highbury or White Hot Lane or whatever. It would go to great lengths not to reveal where he was. Um, and as a kid, I never, I never, believe it or not, I never worked out that where Brian Moore was on a Sunday. When he gave, when he gave his um, post-match report 
on a, a, you know at five o'clock on a, or four forty as it was then on Saturday afternoon, that that was where the main match was coming from the next day on Big Match. I never I never equated to two. <laughs> Didn't, still didn't realise. I would now. It's obvious, wasn't it? But my brother, who was six years old, and he used to say, oh, yeah, I know what the main match on um, the big match is going to be Arsenal v Birmingham, Arsenal v Coventry. I said, how do you know? He said, I just do. <laughs> but that was because he'd seen five and more teams, but I never knew as a kid. So it was always, a, it was always a, you know, a big moment for me. He says, oh, we're going to be, uh, we're going to Upton Park now for, you know, West Ham v Derby. As a kid, it was always a really big deal for me it was really exciting you know but the whole thing was exciting the whole thing for me was really really exciting and of course other but there's other there's other programs people remember i know this is about football but you know stuff like thunderbirds was on sundays yes. and those kind of things particularly and that's a great um, atv production of course you know um so all these things and then we'd have the persuaders afterwards or the protectors you know avenues and alleyways yeah. that's uh, tony yeah. christie's song uh, we'd have the golden shot you know we'd have the top 40 countdown so it was all this kind of sweet it all started happening for me after lunch on um, sunday when you just had to get through the morning and then you'd get the great football fix and you'd get things like the golden shot you get you get thunderbirds even black beauty i mean to love the theme tune to black beauty that's what kind of takes me right back you know the program i love the theme tune you know um so yeah it's kind of a, it's kind of a celebration of all that kind of that football the glorification of football on Sunday afternoons and a unashamed wallow down in, in nostalgia to the, to the commentators and the programs and the teams and the, the players that kind of illuminated our screens, if you like, in the, uh, in that sweet spot, you know, before the premier league, you know, um, you know, the years of sticker albums and scorcher and score for me and shoot magazine and, all that kind of stuff and league ladders in shoot that we, I'm sure we all grew up with and love. Um, so it's kind of about that, really, um, Paul. You know, and um, it's been a hard, it's been a hard road put together. I must admit, it took, it was nearly, nearly, um, you know, it took, it took ages, you know. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it, and I really enjoyed doing it. I've met some fantastic people, and. I can't speak highly enough of the families of Brian Moore and Hugh Johns and Margaret Sinstad, actually. Gerald Sinstad's um, widow has been wonderfully, wonderfully helpful. And um, so many people have really, really given me their time and taken me right back. And, you know, I was interested in how these programmes were put together. So the, the big match team has said, it described, and I've ashamed. I've gone into that, you know, how was it put together? How did you edit it? How do you decide what games were going to be played and it was it was really hard work turning those programs around in time for sunday afternoon doing the editing and the goal they called it the goals exchange it'd be about eight o'clock every saturday night all the regions would have what's called a an exchange where say lwt you know had their main match which is might might be qprv burnley for instance but they'd seen okay well arsenal were, were at um uh, we're at Leicester and it was a three all draw so we'll take that we'll take six minutes of that and then oh we might have a bit you know Newcastle beat um, uh, I don't know Norwich three one so we'll take a bit of that from Tyne Tees so this was all going round all the regions ATV you know they might have Birmingham v Liverpool as the main match but they say okay yeah we'll have a bit of uh, QPR Burnley as our second match and we'll have a little bit of um, Newcastle v Norwich as our third match you know so, and that was being played out everywhere so and it, there's so it's like this network of uh, film being transferred across the um, the region late on a Saturday night as all these different programs are put together and I found all that fascinating. You know, it might be a bit, bit mechanical, but I, I I love all that stuff. You know, we were absolutely spoiled. You know, back in the day we were spoiled. Now we it's were. so homogenised. If you'd look at Brian Moore, for instance, and you'd kind of try and guess what ground he was at these days, all the grounds look the same. Yeah, all, they do, all, yeah. all the players playing the same way. You know, the ball, it's the same ball. There's no yeah. jeopardy. The pitches are all the same. No, Everything, the absolutely. kits are almost the same. There was yeah. iconic kits. Crystal Palace's kit, iconic. And you, you've hit the nail on the head. Iconic, different. Yeah. You've hit the nail on the head. Kits, great kits, yeah. great badges. Yep. You know, and that's all yeah. that's all included in this. So all those things, exactly right, Paul. Those little things that might be lost in the sands of time. 
those great kits of, as you say, Palace, Norwich, that wonderful, uh, you know, yellow and green, looking great on these newly bought oh, yeah. coloured TVs, you know, the black and white of Newcastle. Um, that's probably sacrilege to a, to a to a Birmingham fan, but the claret blue of Aston Villa and Absolutely. you know all these yeah. you know and the great Coventry kits the light the you know the light blue Man City blue v Man City v Man United light blue light red I know they're still there but there was something purer about the um, the kits the Admiral and kit the badges the Admiral oh, the Admiral, kit the, oh, the Coventry yeah. the Man United me. and don't start me you know yeah, it, no. the, everything was just pioneering, groundbreaking, different, independent, everything that you would want. A footballer would do something, you'd be mesmerised, you'd take your ball out on the playground or yeah. over the fields or the pitches or whatever, you'd put your jumpers down for goalposts. We didn't go on our PlayStation, we never had a PlayStation. No, exactly. We had no, a proper Wembley trophy or yeah, a case. As soon as it was over, it was get. Oh. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It was get the ball out, get your boots yeah. on, get out wherever you could. Um, let's replicate the goal we've just seen John Toshak score at Anfield, or you know whatever. Yeah. And uh, yeah, as you say you, we say we were spoiled though. Um, it's interesting because you think in some ways, Paul, we were kind of we were watching what we were given when we were given it, you know, but mm-hmm. we still yeah. loved it. And I yeah. think, but I think the sparsity of the material made it more special. Now we could watch. You know, you probably you probably watch five or six games a day if you wanted to around yeah. the world. Yeah. Then it was it was sparse. We got we, we, it was very rare, um, and so we enjoyed it. We lapped it up. That's why you had to be in front of the telly at two o'clock on a Sunday. Actually, missed it. Remember, we didn't have video recorders until no. seventy nine eighty. No. So you know, if you missed it. That was it. It's gone. You're not going to see it. So you made damn sure you're in front of that telly um, and watching the game. And it made stars of the of all these players, didn't it? And it was um, it was great. And uh, yeah, I was sounding we're sounding like what we are, aren't we? Middle aged, um, nostalgic men, as Paul Fletcher um, would say. Long we sound continue. like a pair of old farts. And 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 but we well, are, we indeed. are we are. But I'll go back. Proud to be. Absolutely, we lived through an age where the players the players were one of us. They'd go to the game on a bus or, you know, park their car next to or live in the same street. Not like nowadays. No, they're like they're remote, they live in, they live in like gates, gated mansions, yeah, yeah. on private drives we, we can't even get down. Um, different times. Yeah. I also talked about, you know, even things like the adverts. The one in those days. They were, we forget, we had to sit through the adverts. But we, everyone knew the adverts. In there's like the Milk Tray, yeah. Double Diamonds, Worthington E, Benson Hedges. All part of it. You know, all part of that Sunday experience. You know, all part of the kind of nostalgic roller coaster, if you like. And uh, it's, very, it's really, really hard to recreate that with words. But I've had, I've had a go. Be your own. Beer at home means Davenport's. That was our yeah. number yeah. one advert during Star Soccer. Yeah, because um, it was all—it was all the adverts that that were directed to men. Wasn't absolutely, it? It but you could have your beer. beer at home because it, it it was before. I mean, we used to have the big, um, what were they called? They were they, they were they were almost like little kegs, wasn't they? Oh, Watney Watney Party Seven. Yeah, what, Watney Party Seven. Yeah. So you had to like you had to pierce them at the That's top. That's right. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, they were impossible to pour, weren't they? Yeah, and and then you'd have like your, your Davenport. You you'd literally you go to the the, the off license round the side of the pub. And you'd yeah, have a fill right. up, and you'd yeah. you'd take your Davenport home and watch Star Soccer. Oh no, it's yeah. happy days, isn't it? I, I just mean, think really, it's a, ro- really is. a romance um, that the kids don't get today. Almost like you. It is. There is, there is a romance. Yeah. It, exactly. That, that, and that that's that's a um, that's a good word to use. It is romance, and that's what I was trying to. It was a romantic element to this. Uh, might seem an odd word, but I think it's actually the right word. Um, romantic kind of nostalgia of all this kind of, uh, as I say, sweet spot, some sweet spot in our mm. memories, our collective memories that we treasure, um, and we wouldn't have eradicated if it, you know if our life depended on it. We, we, they're, they're, they're very very special, and everybody's got a different memory yes. of these programs. Everybody's got a unique experience about how they used to watch. The version in Time Teas was called Shoot. You know, you know how they you know shoot or the kick off match in Granada or Star Soccer in 
80 rule, the big match. Everyone's got their own memories. Every routine they used to have. Oh, I remember my dad used to wash the car on a Sunday and he'd come in and after dinner he'd want to, us to help with washing up, but we'd go and watch the football. And all these kind of people have got every... But everyone's got a memory. Everyone's got a memory of um, of uh, their own personal experience of enjoying these programmes. And um, there's a kind of innocence about it. And... Uh, but it's something glorious about it as well. So um, that's kind of what I was trying to capture, I think, with this uh, with this book, which I say is the first of uh, several. So I ain't finished yet. So this first one, Brian Moore saved our, our Sundays, yeah, which is looking at regionalised uh, TV programmes. Um, that's the first one. That's coming out twentieth of May, isn't it? 20, yeah, 20th or 20, 24th, is it 20th of May? Yeah, certainly about that time. Yeah, and it's May, published yeah. by the wonderful publishers, Pitch yeah. Publishing. Did Duncan yeah. come up with the uh, the artwork for your front cover? Yeah, color? Duncan Olner. He's, he's brilliant, yes, isn't he? Yes, he did, yeah, that very... Uh, he's a genius, yeah, no, though, I really, you know. I really like that. Did you get much yeah, no, really time like. talking to Duncan? I'd love to do a podcast with Duncan. I think so many, so, I mean, I look at so many of uh, Pitch Publishing, and I think Duncan's an absolute genius. The way he just yeah, gets, he gets that front cover, and you just go, that's oh, just genius. That is a yeah, genius I know, front and, cover. Uh, and we haven't even mentioned Cluffy, have we? Because the, the, the cover of, um, um, of Book by More Save Our Sundays has got Moro talking to, um, to Brian Clough got Brian, the two Brian's and that's very much kind of puts it right in that period, you know, cause Cluffy of course was massive, oh, yeah. um, you know, so going from Hartlepool to Derby. Um, and it's very much in that period. He was like everywhere in like the early seventies and Gary Newborn yeah. will tell a great story about, he was the only person that he knew that could stop it. Cause in those days, um, every club had a really big social, really busy, vibrant social club that was packed before games. I'm sure Birmingham might have had one, you know. And he said, Cluffy was the only person he knew that when he came on the box, he could silence an entire room, yeah. that people would stop stop drinking their pints or smoking their fags and have a look at the, the box, because he could do that. Cluffy had that kind of... Um, uh, ability, if you like. So he's kind of he's kind of all over the book as well. The kind of controversies that he got involved in, and um, so yeah, I mean, it was. Um, I hope people enjoy the book. I mean, it's um, as much as I enjoyed writing it because um, it was, as I say, it's a bit of a cliche, but it was a real labour of love and um, one that um, I think my wife would be glad to see the back of it because um, oh, she hasn't seen me for about um, six months, but. Um, um, she said, "We still writing because you writing about football again." Yeah, sorry. I said, "Why are you what?" She goes, "Why are you watching York City v Southampton from 1971?" Um, and it's not an easy one to answer. I have to say, <laughs> but, you know, just I just I just am, you know. But you talk about Brian so, Clough um, there. The, the managers were bigger mavericks than the mavericks at times. We got oh, Malcolm absolutely. Allison. We got Big Run, who oh, come a little bit later. Um, yeah, but, you know, yeah. you, we had so many Bill Shankly, of course, and Shanks. We had Tom, Tommy Doherty, Matt Busby, um, Busby Doherty. Yeah, we had. Um, yeah, I mean, and yeah, they stayed so... around, didn't they? You know, you, yeah. you, your club would have the same manager throughout the decade. You, you'd yeah. very. I mean, now they'll have three or four managers in a season. That's <laughs> right. I mean, you had, you had Freddie Goodwin at Birmingham. You had Tony yeah. Waddington at Stoke. You oh, know, legend, you one had, God. Uh, yeah, it's a, absolutely. Jimmy and Bloomfield. Commentary. Yeah, Bloomfield Leicester. at Leicester, yeah. Play, managers like John Bond, you know, went from Bournemouth to uh, yep. to Norwich, you know, did great. And of course, Bobby Robson, you can't sort of forget the things he did at Ipswich. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. And of course, you mentioned Malcolm Allison. Malcolm Allison was one, you know, involved in one of the great moments on the big match, a massive great row with um, Alan Mullery just after the 1970 World Cup. Yeah. Um, Alison and Mullery had a, had a proper spat on telly with Jimmy Hill sort of refereeing. I don't think you'd get nowadays. It's no, kind of, there's, there's, no. there's a rawness and an honesty. Everyone's tiptoeing around each other. Then it was, they were just going for it, you know, and um, it was really refreshing. And again, that's the sort of thing that ITV did. They wanted that edge. They wanted that edginess to its programmes at the BBC. The BBC was always very safe. I'd never not match the day because it's it's an icon. It's an yeah. iconic programme in its own right. Mm. And it's a fantastic programme. But it, it wasn't edgy. It was very, very highly produced and brilliant. 
with great commentators. I mean, I got to know Barry Davis really well. Barry Davis, what a fantastic guy he is. And John Motson before he died, they're great commentators. Um, and it was a great program, but, but it perhaps didn't have the edge of uh, um, ITV, um, which pushed, pushed the envelope out a little bit more. Did you cover the Alan Mullery when he was mic'd up in 1982? I haven't got to that yet, but I will be. Don't worry. I'll, yeah. be, I'll be doing that. That'll be in a subsequent volume. Don't worry. No, I've got... Oh, so, see, the thing is, Paul, there's so much yeah. um, uh, material out there um, that, you know, I could I could probably do 10 books. I mean, I won't, because probably people get sick of it. But um, <laughs> there's so much material out there. And, um, yeah, I certainly will be doing Mallory, Mallory being mic'd up um, in, in a subsequent edition. But the Mallory, the Mallory Allison spat was a memorable moment on the big match. The two of them were just like throwing you just really going for it and it was all televised and it was great and the, the, the lwc loved all that kind of stuff they loved controversy um not for the sake of it but they knew that's what the viewers wanted they knew that football created stories and it wasn't just about watching 20 minutes highlights there were offshoots there were things to discuss and their view was they wanted to know what what are, the, what are people going to be talking about in the classrooms yeah. factories and pubs tomorrow because we want that on our program uh, it's a bit like the 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 the, uh, the approach taken by Talk Sport today. Um, they don't always get it right, but they understood that the talking points that people want. They will yeah. be talking. Did you see that great goal by Stan Bowles? Did you see that fantastic overhead kick by Frank Worthington? Yeah. You know, all that kind of stuff. You know, and 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 they played on that and they did it did very well, I think. But going back to Mullery and yeah. Malcolm Allison, that yeah. was a, um, an overspill from the 1970 World Cup. And, and, and Mike, um, Malcolm Allison was qu- quite critical about yes. one of Mullery's performances in, yes. in, in that World Cup, wasn't it? So, he again, was. it spilled over and they invited them both. Because they knew what was going to happen. Mullery's Absolutely. no shrinking violet and big big Mal, I mean, like Fedora and the cigar. I mean, he, he was a larger-than-life yeah. character. So, they knew fireworks. It was just, yeah. get him in the and studio, they bang. They didn't disappoint, oh. did they? And uh, it was like, basically, you know, um, Alison was saying, I don't think you're a world-class player. You're not as good yeah. as the likes of, you know, Ovo. He said you're not as good as Moore or uh, Ball or Bell. Yeah. You know, and, and Mallory said, I said, I'm quicker. You know, I'm quicker than Ball. Like, you know, all this kind of, you know, so it was a very much, a, it almost felt, you, you were kind of almost like spying on a, yeah, sort of row between two people, but it was televised for the night. So that was great. So another moment. I played that in full. Actually, I transcribed that quite uh, because it was such such dynamite television that um, I thought that that warranted it's kind of quite a, a, a big bit of coverage. So, but Malcolm Allison, as you say, what a huge character he was, and he, again made for television. Yes. The fedora, the, the big sheepskin, the big furry coat, the big cigar. You know the you know you know and he, he made his name really on that seventy World Cup panel with yeah. Derek Dugan and Bob McNabb and um, et cetera et cetera, which was you know took the whole concept of a panel, dragged it into the modern age really, and that's the template for the kind of modern panel that we we still see to this day really. It wouldn't have happened, but that was all LWT. That was all. I think that was the idea of John Bromley and, and John Bromley was head of sport at um, uh, uh, ITV and Jimmy Hill. That was their idea, you know, get these big characters on telly talking about the game. And it, and it was brilliant. It worked fantastically. And I have to say, uh, Brian Moore um, orchestrated that panel brilliantly because he, yeah. he was almost like a, a kind of referee arbiter. But he let him just give him enough flexibility or space to really say what they wanted to. But he didn't let it spill over. And again, that was a mark of him as a great um, broadcaster and journalist, actually. Absolutely. So you've got this first book coming out. When are yeah. the follow-up books going to be coming out, Matt? I'm sorry, Paul. I just just lost you there. When are the um, the other books going to be coming out? So this one, well, the first when, one when, comes out May. In May, yeah. Uh, to be decided, Paul. I need a bit of a rest now. Got you. Um, uh, but I will be doing it... Um, well, basically, when I write it, is the answer to that. So I can't give you an answer, but don't worry, I'll let you know as soon as I am. So the second half of the decade, again, a whole new set of players come in, your, your Hoddles and your... Uh, who else was in their second second uh, period? I mean, the great Nottingham Forest side, of course. Yeah. Um, Villa And Liverpool's ascendancy, you know, to the top, the likes of, you know, Keegan really becoming great player. We've got the Argentinian 
angle arrives in 78 with our dealers and via yeah. so you've got all these kind of things happening in the 70s international players start to come and, and tv loved all these kind of things you know um and uh yeah and one of the, the players i really enjoyed watching is remembering just what a great striker malcolm mcdonald was actually oh, the first newcastle yeah what a what a player old malcolm was and great tv because he was actually quite eloquent and articulate he 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 he, he, he didn't um he he'd say what he thought, you know. He said, "Where well, we're gonna we're gonna thrash Liverpool in the FA Cup final in 1974." And of course, they he didn't. Actually, um, didn't say that, you know. No, he he, he didn't. You know, I was no, I no, was I, I know, but but he he worked for the Sun, didn't he? That's uh, Malcolm. Right. That's absolutely right. And yeah. it was a go, ghost written with one of um, the hacks up there. But but Liverpool and the media copped hold of this. Yeah, no, and right, really absolutely. turned it into something that Malcolm actually never said. In fact, no, you're right. Malcolm you're right. is probably the only footballer that turned up um, at the new ground in his signing on fee, which is a great story that Malcolm told me. When yeah. he transferred from Luton, he, he was driven up in, uh, in a Rolls Royce. And uh, when he's... Yeah, so, fantastic. When he's turned, you know, the... the, the, the um, the fella, I think he was a director or a friend of a director at Luton Town, and he's driven him up. And they pulled over, and this is right. You get in the back now. You get in the back, Malcolm. And then he was to come out, got his hat on, and he opened it up. Malcolm come out and uh, to be greeted by the press. And his mate, who was one of the the journalists up there, said, "This is the only player that's ever turned up in his signing on fee." They thought it was Brilliant. Malcolm's Rolls Royce. But again, Brilliant. I mean, what a <laughs> le- and he also he always went to sleep, you know, before the game of football. Yeah, and of course, I mean, just that great home debut, that hat trick he got against Liverpool yeah. in one of his early games in oh, August, yes. September seventy one. Yeah, what a fantastic yeah. bit, fantastic bit of TV that, and great goals by McDonald and all. And of course, in in that seventy four cup run. He was on fire. He didn't yeah. turn up for the final. Scored in the game. Was, well, every round. Yeah, those two yeah. great goals against Burnley in yeah. the semi-final. You know, it was a um, fantastic player. So, you know, those, those players, it's been... And, and Rodney Marsh, you know, particularly in his early days at QPR. He didn't do it so much for Man City, but some of the yeah. goals he used to score in his early days, in the late 60s, early 70s. Again, another player that the big match when it was in black and white, actually, made a star of people like that. Martin Peters, some of those goals he got at West Ham, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, just just brilliant. And um, um, the atmosphere, you can hear on those coming out of the, the stadiums, those, because the mics were always quite loud. Um, I love it, all that. You know, I love, I love it. And I think we, we'll, we'll never get it back. We'll never get those... No, it's gone. We'll never get these days back. Nah. You know, they, they've gone, you know, but we cherish them. That's... that's um, and we have to retain them, and that's kind of where I'm coming from on these. Absolutely, and I'm looking forward to purchasing your book. Other people that want to purchase the book, what's the easiest way for them to hook up with you and and buy your book ultimately? Well, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, Amazon or Food Pitch website. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, they're the, the two, the two, the two ones, and it's going to be, you know, I'm told it's going to be in all the shops as well. So, you know, Waterstones, W. H. Smith. Um, and other good good booksellers, as they say, you know. But all the all the usual um, uh, locations, Paul, the book uh, will be available, and um, I hope it um, will be. I hope it will be enjoyed by people. That will be my. Um, that's my my desire. It's not a. It's not a thing. I don't think it's not, it's not about being successful and selling millions. But if it if it if it brings joy to a few people, um, then I'll be really pleased. It's certainly going to bring joy to me. You've brought joy to me in this Thanks. podcast can i thank you so much for Thanks, your time that and guys you can i'm guessing pre-order uh now because pitch usually do a pre-order so you can pay your money up front get it into the top 10 get it uh being talked about as well because i think it's going to be a bestseller one of the best-selling books of 2024 and i'm already looking forward to uh to part two matt so thank you very much sir Thank you, Paul. Pleasure. Thank you for having me on. And your Facebook and Twitter accounts before uh, you leave me, because people are going to say, Paul, how can we link up with Matt now? Can yeah, we just, just, a... just say thanks for writing this book? It's a, you know, the retro market. I think he's a great market. I agree. Um, 
and I think there's so many of us older guys that love to look back and and read all these various publications. Absolutely. Well, just just Matt Eastley on Facebook, be be be, be my guest to, to join up, and a rather strange, I called Emmy Vinyl Revival on um, Twitter. Emmy Vinyl Revival. That's another great love of my life is music and, and yeah. collected vinyl records. So Emmy Vinyl Revival. You'll find me on uh, on X, as I think we call it now. Yeah, I do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that's all about. I still call it. No, Twitter. I don't either. But I still call. I think everyone still calls it Twitter, don't they? But uh, hopefully, people will find me on there. So feel free to to hook up and follow me, and um, you know, I'll follow you back. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your time again. My pleasure. Matt. No problem. And uh, pass on our best wishes to all at Pitch. Keep on publishing fantastic publications so we can read all about those Alcyon days of the golden age of football. Cheers, Perfect. mate. Lovely. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, thanks Paul. pal. Bye bye, and thanks for listening, guys. Bye-bye. Cheers, Matt. Bye bye now. Bye bye. <laughs>